Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about hacking internet kiosks. Um, it's pretty much my favorite subject these days. Uh, I want to cover over what is an internet kiosk uh, and a kiosk software security model. Pretty much how these things tick, how they work. Uh, yeah. Uh, then I want to talk about some vulnerabilities in kiosk software and vulnerabilities in the core kiosk security model. Uh, vulnerabilities in how these things are designed. Uh, why kiosks are fundamentally insecure. And pretty much, I'm going to show you how you can hack any Windows Internet kiosk in less than 120 seconds. Guaranteed. <laughs> that shit pop shells. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, then we have a, there's a DEF CON exclusive. I'm going to be uh, releasing a couple tools, some things that are quite cutting edge, quite new and funky. Then we have some live demos up here. And then hopefully, if we have time, I'm going to hack two uh, commercial Internet kiosks that I have virtualized on my laptop up here. Uh, and then after this talk, you're welcome to go rape and pillage throughout Vegas. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, one of the downsides of living in New Zealand is I spent a hell of a lot of time in airports, uh, stopovers. And last year, I spent eight hours in Hong Kong. And I was sitting there after, after this flight, uh, and I was like scratching my head and I didn't really know what to do sitting in this airport, and I saw this internet kiosk sitting in the corner. And I actually saw a queue of these like uh, Asian businessmen waiting to use the kiosk. I thought to myself, man, that kiosk is real popular. And I thought, <laughs> I wonder if I could hack it. I wonder if I could like go see the kiosk or loan party it. I thought, oh man, that would, that would be pretty cool. That's a good way to kill time at a stopover, right? Uh, and then, then I, something kind of dawned on me, and I realized that, oh, these kiosks are really popular. You know, I see these everywhere. And people also use them, but I rarely hear about them. You know, um, I don't often uh, see publications in security focus on how to hack kiosks. You know, bug track, I don't really see postings on latest kiosk vulnerabilities. So it dawned on me that uh, we have a pop very popular service which has very poor security visibility. And this, of course, equals a very, very good attack target. That's why I said, you know, right here, right now, I want to find every possible method of hacking an internet kiosk. And I want to become the fucking king of internet kiosk hacking. Because I don't think there's anyone else out there who's the king of internet kiosk hacking. All right, so I want to go back to New Zealand. I, I started keeping my eye out for kiosks. I basically found them everywhere. I found them in airports, train stations, libraries, DVD rental stores, uh, corporate building lobbies, uh, convenience stores, post office, cafes, hospitals, motels, hotels, and universities. Uh, now, while I've been in Vegas, I've been walking up and down the strip, and every casino here has at least five or ten kiosks. There are kiosks out in the lobby out there. Hands up if you've used those kiosks. I wouldn't. <laughs> I've used them too. <laughs> okay, now, I think this is primarily because uh, you don't really need a quad-core Xeon to run a kiosk. You know, you can have really cheap, shitty technology sitting in the corner of your office and set up a kiosk. So we have kiosks now everywhere because, you know, you can build one for 100, 200 bucks. That's my uh, pictures of kiosks of here. Okay. okay, so my initial observations of kiosks. Well, from a hardware perspective, uh, kiosks are usually built in these really tough, rugged, hard shell cases. They're usually fiberglass or wooden shell. Uh, they have a lack of physical access to the computer case. So you can't access the floppy drive, DVD, USB, or Firewire. Uh, the kiosk is usually also bolted to the ground or it's padlocked. Or it has a big secure lock on it attaching it to something. Generally, the idea is that the general public, i.e. you and me, uh, we're evil hackers. And the kiosk vendor does not trust us. Uh, so every attempt is made to make sure the kiosk cannot be stolen or just generally messed with. Now, from a software point of view, uh, the majority of kiosks I've noticed actually run uh, commercial kiosk software on Windows. Now, I have noticed that Linux and uh, BSD kiosks exist, but Windows is far more popular. It just outweighs it. Uh, basically, there are 44 commercial Windows kiosk products on the market. The Windows kiosk uh, market is actually a multi-billion dollar industry. It's absolutely huge. And it's basically marketed as being able to turn that old shitty computer in the back of your office into instant revenue. You know, you go out and you buy my $59 shareware app, you install it on your crappy computer, and instantly you can make some money. Now, these kiosks, uh, kiosks are essentially uh, Windows skinned, all right? So a kiosk browser will implement standard Internet Explorer libraries. Uh, I'm talking win, http.dll, and msinet.ocx. 
Uh, and the windows are sort of drastically skinned to feel like a kiosk or to look like a kiosk. Uh, you can usually still tell that these things are windows, but it doesn't really look like windows. You know, it looks bastardized. It looks kind of gimped or changed. So I realized that uh, kiosk software is really the best um, attack target. Uh, I was thinking, you know, maybe I can try some hardware hacks on these things. But then I thought, well, sitting in, uh, you know, the Hong Kong airport in my eight-hour stopover with a pair of bolt cutters probably isn't going to work so well when I want to hack with the kiosk. Uh, so I determined that I need to be able to walk up to any internet kiosk and I need to pop shell quickly. Um, I need explore.exe to pop up or cmd or command.com and time limited, you know. I don't want to be there for an hour and a half hacking. Um, I have to do this in less than five minutes. I have to do this really, really fast. Um, that and these kiosks cost money. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't want to spend money on this shit. Okay, so I've spent the last 16 months uh, researching methods of penetrating uh, kiosk software. Uh, what I did was I virtualized the top 10 most popular Windows kiosk products in VMware. Um, I detailed and compared the security model of each of the kiosks. Basically, you see what each kiosk defends against and how it works, and then compared it against all the other kiosks. And then I researched new methods of compromising uh, these internet kiosks. And I developed a kiosk attack methodology. Basically, a whole set of tests you can do on a kiosk that is pretty much guaranteed to pop shell. Um, and my startling result, of course, 10 out of 10 of my kiosks, 100% success rate, you know, they all die. OK, so the kiosk security model. Now, kiosk, sec kiosk software is in implements security by two distinct approaches. Uh, firstly, they try and reduce available host functionality. So this is uh, disallowing native OS functionality that can be used maliciously. So an example of this would be disabling command prompt. Uh, you do this by setting a registry key for disable CMD. And if you try and run uh, cmd.exe, it'll pop up and say command prompt has been disabled, so you can't run it. Uh, there are many other examples of this, disabling uh, task manager, disabling uh, regedit, things like that. And the second approach is jailing the user into a secure kiosk browser application. So you're essentially stuck inside this kiosk browser, right? Uh, the kiosk browser is ran in full screen. You don't have any ability to minimize, close, or get rid of the browser. Uh, the start bar, the tray menu, is usually removed or hidden. And the only thing you can do is browse the web. Um, this doesn't mean that the operating system isn't there anymore. There's still windows under this. You just can't access it. You can't physically click on something that'll give you windows. Here's, a, here's an example. Here's a screenshot for you. This is Site Kiosk. This actually looks very similar to Windows. Uh, if you notice the, tra uh, the tray bar and the start button, it looks a bit different. It looks quite custom. Um, and you see that the, the start menu has Site Kiosk on there. And you only have one option, and that's to open up a new browser window. Um, so you're pretty much trapped inside this, this sort of user interface. Here's another example. This is NetStop Kiosk. This is actually the kiosk that is used down in the lobby just out there. Uh, this has a, a custom taskbar. This actually doesn't have any buttons or pop-ups, anything at all. Uh, the kiosk application is ran as a full-screen desktop application. Uh, you don't have any ability to close it, um, and you can only browse the internet using this. Um, it doesn't give you the ability to launch other applications or click on things or really do anything interesting. All right, so um, keep these kiosk browsers actually proactively monitor your usage. Uh, they're trying to defend against malicious hackers like us. So a kiosk contains numerous blacklists of prohibited activity. So if you try and do something sneaky, the kiosk will stop you. For example, uh, inside kiosk, if you try and pop up the internet browser and you browse to C colon slash, it'll pop up this little message box saying, accessing this URL is prohibited. It won't let you. Kiosks also monitor all the in-focus modal dialogues that pop up. So uh, if you try and pop up a save file dialog, it'll detect that window has popped up and instantly close it for you. It'll send a, a WM close message to the dialog ID the, of the window that pops up, and it closes. It goes away. So this really limits what you can do with the kiosk using the browser. Again, this is a, another method of reducing functionality. A kiosk also implement API hooking. So they hook native OS API calls, which can be used maliciously. Things like kill process, get command line W, alloc console. I mean, how are you ever going to be able to run cmd.exe if you can't call alloc console? Uh, the kiosk browser is usually ran in a high security zone. So file downloads are all disabled. Uh, browser scripting, pop-ups, ActiveX, all disabled. 
Um, and typically, there's usually a watchdog timer that will run. And maybe every four or five minutes, the kiosk will enumerate all of the active windows and processes and see if you're trying to do anything malicious. See if there's a copy of CMD, ru CMD running or anything that you shouldn't be doing, and it'll kill that process instantly. Now, the kiosks also implement a custom keyboard driver. So they disable uh, all the window shortcut key combinations. So if you try and do things like Control, Shift, Escape, to try and pop up the task manager, or Alt F4. You know, you'll find that the modifier keys are actually unmapped. So Control, Tab, Alt, Start, the function keys, they don't exist. They don't work. Uh, you'll find you have a custom mouse. So you don't actually have a right mouse button. You only have a left mouse button. Again, more methods of reducing how you can actually uh, interact with the kiosk. It's limiting you, so you can only click on shit with the left mouse button in Google. Uh, a good example of this is that uh, picture of the keyboard just up there. That's a very common uh, kiosk keyboard. And you see that it's missing a whole lot of keys. It's missing all the good keys. <laughs> all right, so hacking kiosk software. Now, the kiosk security model is based on reducing functionality. It's limiting functionality that can be used to escape the kiosk browser. So exploiting a kiosk requires invoking functionality. We need to cause applications or functionality to spawn or pop up on screen. And we need to use that invoked functionality to then escape the kiosk jail. Uh, we want to spawn a command prompt and then essentially get back to Windows. Uh, we want to get out of the kiosk, kill the kiosk, get rid of it. Now, kiosks implement blacklists, as I said. Uh, blacklists, by nature, are never actually 100%. You can never have a blacklist that will cover every possible permutation, the downfall of a blacklist. We only need one method of escaping the kiosk software jail. We just need one command shell. And that's all we need. Um, and this basically means that, uh, yeah, kiosks are very, very hackable. OK, so what are the available kiosk input vectors? Uh, this one, the, the first thing I did when I was looking at hacking these kiosks was I did some threat modeling. And I basically worked out every which way I can communicate or interact with the kiosk. Uh, these are my input vectors. And then the question is, how can I use these input vectors to then invoke functionality? So we have two main streams of input. Firstly, we have physical input. So this is interacting with the kiosk GUI. This is using the keyboard or the mouse, uh, clicking on buttons, graphics, menus, typing values into text input fields. And secondly, we have remote input. So this is browsing a website from the kiosk terminal. Can I use remote content to interact with my kiosk at all? OK, so what do we need to do? Well, firstly, we need to escape the kiosk graphical jail. We need to minimize or close the kiosk browser application. And we want to pop a command shell. Then we will need to kill the kiosk browser process. So like task kill, forward slash im, kiosk browser, dot exe. And then we need to uh, re-enable or get back the real Windows start bar and essentially get back to Windows. I want to have like a virgin Windows XP sitting there where the kiosk used to be. I reckon from there I can pretty much do anything I want. You know, you, you can do anything with Windows. And then secondly, I need to start downloading additional binaries to the kiosk. So I might want to download a port scanner, a Metasploit, a rootkit, a Trojan, or a keylogger. You know, I want to then infect the kiosk and start continuing my ownage. OK, so let's say you find a kiosk in your local mall. And there's a big sign up saying, uh, $1 for one hour of internet usage. You have to use the dollar. You have to insert a dollar. I haven't found any tricks like bypass the whole money requiringness of a kiosk. So you shove in your dollar, and you find you're trapped inside this kiosk browser. You know the right mouse button has been disabled. Is you have a custom keyboard, and certain keys have been removed. You know this feels like a Windows OS. You can see like some of the icons, some of the graphics are very similar, uh, but it has a very custom design layout. Maybe the start bar is labeled the Super Kiosk Start Bar, or some shit like that. Um, and you only have one visible button to start browsing. So first thing you do is, well, you start browsing. Okay, so first thing you're going to try and do is browse the local file system using the kiosk browser. This is the most obvious attack, the most obvious exploit. So a local Windows user, i.e. a person sitting on a keyboard, is capable of accessing the file system because you're a local user. So kiosk software must explicitly block local browser attempts. Now. You can see in that, uh, that screenshot there that if I type C colon backslash Windows backslash, it uh, pops up a little message box saying, sorry, this drive is not available. Now, the good thing about Windows is that it's basically designed for fat-fingered idiots, right? It's catering for people who mistype shit when they're drunk. 
<laughs> so maybe C colon backslash windows backslash is blocked, but what about C colon forward slash windows backslash? What about file colon forward slash forward slash C colon forward slash windows? Uh, so I got a little table there of all the possible permutations that I could come up with. And you can see now how blacklists start failing really fast. Because the blacklist probably only blocks one, maybe two of those examples. Maybe three, maybe four. Uh, what about uh, environment variables? Typing things like percent winder percent. You know, that doesn't have any backslashes or C or anything like that in it, you know. So that, um, these tricks, that bypasses actually quite a few kiosks. We can use common dialogues to hack kiosks. This is a relatively known trick, relatively known trick. So uh, Windows contains common dialog libraries. Uh, these are things like saving a file, opening a file, uh, selecting a font, and choosing a color. Uh, these come from comdlg32.dll, uh, the common Windows dialog library. Now comdlg32.dll implements common Windows controls. These controls come from comctl32.dll. Now the file open and file save dialog contain what's called the file view control. Uh, this is the same control that actually Windows Explorer uses. Uh, the file view control provides full Explorer functionality. So essentially, a file open dialog equals Explorer, because it's the same, ex same control being used. Uh, and we can use that to launch processes. And you see this. So let's say you, you get to your kiosk, um, and you see there's this pretty UI. My first thing I do is I go around and I click every single button, every single icon, every single graphic, everything I can. I, I, just, I just mash everything systematically. I basically see if I can invoke a file open dialog. Maybe there's an ability to send an email to a friend and attach a file. And when you attach a file, you pop up the file open dialog, which has the file view control, and then you browse to C colon slash, right click cmd.exe, and run it. Um, if you find on some kiosks where you don't have a right click button, you can drag another file onto cmd.exe, and cmd will spawn. So you want again. Now, the Internet Explorer image toolbar. This is actually a toolbar that hovers in the top left whenever you click a really large image. Uh, and each icon of this toolbar can invoke a common dialog. Uh, this will allow you to invoke a file save, file print, file mail to, mail to uh, and open my pictures in Explorer. It will directly spawn Explorer. Now, if the kiosk is written using Internet Explorer libraries, this toolbar is present because it's part of the Internet Explorer libraries. So it's a pretty easy test to do. You click a really large image somewhere on the kiosk, and you see this toolbar pops up. If it does, you win. Um, in the case of the file print example, um, you can use file print to then say print to a file and spawn a file open dialog. Same trick. You get another common dialog, you win. OK, so using the keyboard. Keyboard shortcuts can be used to access the host OS. So another good check is to see if a custom keyboard driver is present. Um, although a lot of keyboards, although a lot of kiosks do implement custom keyboard drivers, a lot of the more budjo ones don't. Uh, so this is a pretty good trick, and it's very, very simple. And you can see the, the modifier keys are enabled. So I have a list of keyboard shortcuts here which will produce common dialogues. It's got Control B, Control I, Control H, Control L, O, P, S. And of course, you also have kiosk specific administrative shortcuts. So Almost every kiosk product has a secret back door that allows an admin to log into it. Uh, it allows an admin to shut down the kiosk or make changes or basically unlock it. So all you do is you go to the keyboard and you mash your fingers over the whole thing. You try weird key combinations. Possibly something pops up in menu. If it does, you win. Or uh, you, know, you, you get a little further. OK, browser security zones. So, Browser security model incorporates multiple security zones. I'm sure you're all aware, well aware of this. So we have the restricted site zone, uh, the internet zone, the intranet zone, and trusted sites. And each security zone adheres to a unique security policy. Uh, so the internet zone actually has less ability to in interact with the kiosk uh, and may be locked down, by the, locked down by the kiosk browser. But the trusted sites and the intranet zone actually have more access. So as a local user on a keyboard, you're actually available, you're, you're allowed to access all security zones. Uh, but the URLs must be typed into the entry bar. So a pretty cool trick you can do with this is by using the about pluggable protocol handler, which belongs to the trusted site security zone. Now, this pluggable protocol handler actually suffers from a cross-site scripting vulnerability. 
What this means is that you can render arbitrary content in the trusted site security zone remotely or as, as a user on a kiosk. So one of the things we can do is by typing about colon uh, less than input percent 20 type equal file greater than, you can pop up a file browse dialog. That's a file browse dialog from within the trusted sites. The kiosk probably isn't going to detect that or uh, be aware of that. This isn't a very well-known trick. Um, and this gets around any kiosk that is only protecting or defending the internet zone, which most kiosks do. Oh, just a, another note on that. Another thing you can do is uh, linking to the file system. So the, the internet zone can't actually link back into the own file system of the browser, but while the trusted sites zone can. So perhaps the kiosk might block or detect the common dialog popping up, but if you can follow a link to the file system, then you win again. Um, that trick works against actually quite a few kiosks, including site kiosk, the first kiosk I showed you. Okay, now the shell protocol handler. The shell handler provides access to Windows web folders. These are URLs, things like shell colon profile, shell colon program files, things like that. Each URL you type in will spawn explorer.exe and browse the particular web folder. Um, so a good thing to check is the shell handler blocked by the kiosk. Can we access that? If you can, you know, you win. What about this? If you type shell colon colon colon, uh, squiggly bracket, long gooid squiggly bracket, you can actually invoke a web folder by the class ID. Uh, so this particular thing is invoking the control panel inside Internet Explorer. So you can bypass any ACLs that may exist on control.exe if the kiosk is trying to block you from accessing the control panel by just popping the control directly inside Internet Explorer. I love IE. <laughs> All right, so the downside to physical input vectors. So I, I realized pretty quickly that Kiosk software is designed to not trust the guy on the keyboard. You know, uh, when people write these apps and they sell them, they're sold as being a secure solution. Um, and a Kiosk user is actually the most obvious security threat. You know, when I'm sitting in the airport, uh, the guy who wrote the Kiosk software is trying to defend against me. He's trying to defend against uh, the guy who's bored who wants to hack the kiosk. So my research concluded that physical inputs, physical inputs are actually not that successful. Um, I was getting a 40 to 50 percent chance of popping shell on a kiosk. It's like 40 to 50 percent. Ah, that's not good enough. I'm not the king of kiosk hacking yet. Uh, so I also realized that a lot of the techniques that I've just told you um, are actually not that original. Um, most of these things have been published. You know, if you Google kiosk hacking, you'll see all the things I've told you. Um, and that's, that's just not good enough. You know, if you're going to come to DEF CON, if you're going to come release something, you've got to have O-Day. You've got to have some cool tricks that no one else has ever seen before. Right? Yeah. yeah. O-Day. Woo. Okay, so I made a really subtle discovery during my research that remote websites are actually not factored into the kiosk security model. It's like, ooh, ooh, that's fun. Uh, websites are actually trusted more than the dude on the kiosk. I was like, whoa, it's getting better and better. Uh, this is because the kiosks rely on the default browser security model. Um, none of the kiosk vendors have actually taken into account a potential malicious website. So what available remote input vectors do we have? This is content visited from a kiosk terminal hosted on a remote website. So we have browser scripting languages. We have VBScript. We've got JavaScript. We've got Java applets. We've got ActiveX. We've got ClickOnce, which is part of uh, .NET. We have protocol handlers. We have file type handlers. We've got Flash. We've got Director. We've got Acrobat. We've got Real Media. We've got QuickTime. We've got Windows Media Player. We've got a hell of a lot more attack vectors than we did being a physical user on a kiosk. So I said to myself, I need a kiosk hacking website. That's pretty much going to be the money. I need an online tool that you can visit from an internet kiosk. And it provides content for you to escape a kiosk jail. So I wrote this thing I called ICAT, the Interactive Kiosk Attack Tool. This is the first of its kind. Nothing else exists like this as far as I know. Uh, it's a new method of hacking internet kiosks. Um, and this is very fast. Um, ICAT can pop shell in less than 120 seconds. And I found that I also have a 95 to 100% success rate using my uh, remote methods. 
Uh, the rest of this talk will detail all the methods in ICAT. And I'll, I'll go through it all, but uh, this is officially being launched now at DEF CON, DEF CON 16. This is available uh, live on the internet at icat.ha.cked.net, icat.hack.net. Um, and you can use this anywhere. This is free. This is freely available. This is all good stuff. OK, so what can ICAT do? Firstly, first thing I thought to myself, while I'm sitting at a kiosk, I'd really like to know what kiosk I'm sitting at. I'd really like to know what's on the kiosk and what I can do with the kiosk. Uh, so I wrote this little uh, JavaScript app which detects all of the installed applications on a kiosk. Um, I use the resource protocol handler to pull out bitmap resources out of an executable, and I verify the height of the extracted bitmap. So if I can prove the bitmap exists from the executable, then I know the executable exists. If the executable exists, then I know the app is installed. So ICAT is capable of detecting about 15 or 20 commercial kiosk products and about 40 or 50 uh, installed applications. Uh, so you can see on a little screenshot on the far right, it's detected the kiosk platform is Netstop Pro Kiosk. Um, it's detected that I have Windows Media Player 11 installed, NetMeeting, .NET Framework 1, 2, MSN Messenger, and Movie Maker. This is really important for me because this tells me what attack vectors I now have available, what input vectors are installed on this kiosk, and how I can now uh, further define or focus my attacks. ICAT can also display local browser variables. Uh, so just using JavaScript, I can pull out all the uh, navigator dot, uh, like app version and app name variables, and basically determine what software the kiosk is written on. So MSINet and WinHTTP.dll actually display Internet Explorer app versions. So I can visit this page on ICAT, and it'll tell me if the kiosk is based on IE, or if it's based on a custom browser control. This gives me more information about the attack target, about what I'm trying to do. Uh, this can also detect the presence of the .NET CLR. You'll see uh, in the uh, Navigator app version that if .NET is installed, it appends itself into the app version. So you can see that this particular kiosk has .NET CLR 2 installed. I can also display remote server variables. So I can discover the remote IP address of the kiosk terminal. Well, it's a pretty handy thing to know, right? I mean. OK, ICAT also contains all common browser dialogues in one place. So you can just click down a list, things pop up, and you can see if they're blocked or not. So I have a, a file open, file print, file save as, and a file uh, and a print preview dialog that'll pop up. Um, and this is pretty handy. That this saves the guesswork and really decreases the time involved in hacking a kiosk. We can also use Flash to invoke common dialogues. So Adobe Flash is the most widely used plugin in the world. Um, according to the Adobe website, there's something like 720 million uh, browsers with Flash currently installed. And ActionScript 3 is capable of invoking three unique file open dialogues. Um, these are select file for upload, select files for upload, and select location for download by site name. Now, the dialogue title in these cases are actually very important, because when a kiosk is monitoring all of the windows that pops up, it's verifying the dialog names against a blacklist. So if I can pop up a common dialog which has a unique dialog title, then it might evade the blacklist. Uh, so the Flash dialogs are not the standard, i.e., choose file dialogs. Um, so that bypasses quite a few blacklists. But they still contain the same file view control. So you still get the same functionality, you just defeat the blacklist. Thanks, Flash. OK, we can also try and spawn applications on the kiosk. So can we cause an application or process to launch on the kiosk? Uh, perhaps the spawn application contains a common dialog. Uh, perhaps we can use that application to then provide additional access to the kiosk or further compromise the host. So ICAT tries to invoke the default Windows URI handlers. It'll try and invoke call to, gopher, HTTP, telnet, tn3270, rlogin, ldap, news, and mail to. Now, essentially, if you click uh, the, the HF, H, uh, the AHREF link that I have on screen there to the mail link, uh, you, the default Windows mail to URI handler will spawn. Um, in most cases, this is Outlook Express. So we can get Outlook Express to pop up. Uh, we can also try and spawn third-party URI handlers, uh, MMS, Skype, SIP, uh, Play, Steam, QuickTime. You know, the list goes on. Whatever is installed on the kiosk, we can make that pop up and potentially use that app to then escape the kiosk jail. 
It's all about invoking functionality, getting shit to pop up, getting something other than browsing the internet. Okay, here's an example, using the HCP, the Help and Support Center in Windows. So if you click the link, the ahref HCP colon forward slash forward slash dummy link, um, you can get Help and Support Center to pop up. And basically, you can use the Help and Support Center to then invoke a command prompt. And how you use it is you basically search for using uh, then the app you want to launch. So if you search for using command prompt, it'll pop up this page on how to use the command prompt, which is really handy. <laughs> and then you'll see in there on the, the far right the little link that says open the command prompt. You notice that you can click that with the left mouse button only. So this is, this is quite cool because most kiosks don't have a right mouse button. So this provides a, a good method of of doing that. And the same for Notepad or pretty much any Windows app. You can just search for using a then app name that you want to launch. Bang, you got it. OK, so ICAP provides links to over 100 different URI handlers. Uh, so you can just click, click, click down the list and see what pops up. Uh, you can determine which handlers are covered by the kiosk blacklist and use the invoke handler to escape uh, the kiosk itself. Um, I've also implemented automatic execution of URI handlers. So by using DHTML and JavaScript, I can sequentially invoke all of these in, all these handlers. So you don't even have to click down the list. You just click once, and then shit just pops up. It just spawns fucking everywhere, <laughs> and you win. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, iCat also contains um, all of the. Um, physical input vectors that I was talking about before, all the URLs to type, all the different permutations of typing in C colon windows, um, all the shell handlers, and also the, the, the GUID uh, shell handlers that I told you about. Because obviously you're not going to be able to remember the GUID of the control panel when you're sitting at the kiosk. You know, I, I can barely remember my name in the morning. I'm not going to remember a GUID. OK, so we can also invoke applications using file type handlers. Now, if you click on a file, such as test.myfile, Windows will spawn the myfile file handler. Now, Internet Explorer actually supports promptless handler execution. Uh, an example of this is Windows Media Player. I think for a seamless integration with the browser or some crap like that, if you click test.wmv, a Windows Media Player will just pop up. It won't actually ask you, hey, are you sure you want to launch Windows Media Player? It will just spawn. Now, this is really, really good for us. Because you remember, kiosks are monitoring all the stuff that pops up. So if nothing pops up, it can't block it. <laughs> uh, so Windows Media Player becomes a, a pretty good trick. Uh, now that's, uh, that's determined by this edit flag setting, which is a binary bit. If the third bit is one, then you don't get any prompt that pops up. And I found a bunch of different apps that basically don't prompt or don't uh, ask you anything before they launch. They just spawn. Um, and of course, the yeah, kiosks fail to detect these things when they launch. Uh, so ICAT, again, uses DHTML and JavaScript to invoke 108 unique file handlers. Uh, so I have a list of every possible file extension I could think of. Um, and it'll try and invoke all of them. So again, you can possibly get 108 different things just popping up, which is good. You, you win again. <laughs> OK, iCat and Windows Media Player files. So I thought to myself, man, this is really cool. Windows Media Player spawns without asking me anything. I've got to expand this. I've got to get some cool tricks out of this. So Windows Media Player will silently launch for the .asx file format. These are the playlist files, right? Who here knew that you can have a playlist which is web enabled? Oh, yeah, a couple of people, a couple of people. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so it's a pretty. I didn't really know you could do this, but you can see in the, the screenshot, uh, screenshot at the top on the right, um, I have a playlist that basically says, hey, I have web content that's available here. So the ASX file that I have available on iCat will actually cause Windows Media Player to pop up and then launch a browser inside itself and rebrowse iCat, which is my tool. Now, th this is. This is a really good trick because when you can get Windows Media Player to act as a browser, it essentially gives you a browser with a lower security control than the kiosk. So you decrease the level of um, paranoia that's uh, implemented in these kiosks. And you can then use Windows Media Player to hack the kiosk again through its browser. Go through the same process. You click everything in ICANN, different shit pops up. You win again. You can use Windows Media Player for your, for your advantage. Um, the only disadvantage on this is the dialogue that pops up that says, uh, this enhanced content you're about to play uses the following web page. 
Uh, you should only open web pages from sources that you trust. Of course, you, you, you trust ICAT, right? Um, and, and no kiosk blocks that dialogue. Well, that's pretty handy. <laughs> okay, so ICAT and Office documents. Uh, so I realized, hey, you know, Office documents are pretty cool. You know, Office is this amazing platform that can do all sorts of crazy stuff. What can I do with Office? So I realized that if you have an Office file viewer installed on a kiosk, you pretty much win. And you win because in an Office document, you can embed an object. So I thought, well, if I can embed an object, why don't I embed an executable? Why don't I embed CMD? Uh, so I have uh, doc files, docx, xlx, xlsb, xlsm, and xlsx, which all contain embedded CMD files. Uh, so if you use the ICAT uh, file handler invocation trick and you find that Office pops up, you may get a document which says something like this, cmd.exe embedded within a doc, doc file. And then you double click it and the open package contents box pops up and it says, warning you very specifically, this package you're about to open will run a program containing this package. That program could do anything. It may harm your computer. Well, I don't really care about the kiosk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, I've got a whole lot more uh, file handler tricks like this, but I don't really want to detail all of them. I have 108 files in ICAT. So basically, I'm just going to say that ICAT will try and spawn the most useful file possible to make your hacking attempt easier, smoother, and faster. OK, ICAT and Java applets. OK, so side Java applets can execute local processes. Did anyone know this? Yeah? Most people knew this? No one? Oh, yeah. All right. So who knew that you can actually get a Java signing cert for free? Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm a, I'm a bit of a cheap ass. <laughs> so you can detect if a JRE is installed by using the ICANT reconnaissance trick, the, the first thing I showed you. And that'll basically tell you if Java is installed. Now, if Java is installed, uh, you can use ICANT to then spawn different Java applets. And those Java applets will try and do different things again. Uh, so, of course, you can spawn CMD, you can spawn uh, Notepad, you can spawn RegEdit, you can spawn command.com. Um, and this little dialog box pops up. It says, warning dash security, the application you're about to run, yada, yada. No kiosk block that dialog. So, again, you win. Um, one of the things I included in here um, was Jython uh, by PDP from Genius Citizen. I don't know if PDP's in the house. PDP in the house? Nope. All right. So uh, Jython is essentially Java inside an applet, which is pretty powerful. No, sorry. Jython is Python inside an applet. So uh, you can invoke Jython from ICAT and get a full Python terminal inside Java inside the kiosk. You can then use Python to just start executing whatever Python code you want to start running and further own the kiosk from within Java, which is pretty handy. OK, what about ActiveX? Now, safe for scripting active access can be used to compromise a kiosk. Well, duh. So we can have an unsafe method within an, an active X control. So object.execute cmd.exe. So the question is, can we install a malicious active X on a kiosk? So what I did was I wrote an active X. It has uh, one method exported called execute, and it'll execute any executable you give it. I wouldn't suggest installing this on your desktop computer. It's a, this is a very insecure ActiveX, right? But it fulfills the purpose uh, of what we're trying to do of executing processes on a kiosk. Now, installing an ActiveX uh, requires administrative authority. So if you have admin rights and if you can install an ActiveX, then you're pretty fucking lucky. And props, you, you got it. Uh, but the chances are this isn't going to work. This isn't a very highly, highly reliable method. Now, I have noticed that ActiveX and the way ActiveX is written and deployed is essentially changing with Internet Explorer 8. So as of Internet Explorer 8, you will not need admin rights to install an ActiveX because technically an ActiveX will no longer be installed, uh, which can potentially mean that in a few years' time, when kiosks start being based on Internet Explorer 8 libraries, uh, this trick will come in very, very handy and will be very powerful and get you lots of shells and ponage. Okay. Click once. So, uh, click once is .NET 2.0 plus technology. Um, who here actually knew what click once was? Oh, well, okay, like four or five hands. All right, oh, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, I, I don't even know about this. I don't even know that you could do this with .NET. So this is called online application deployment. It uses the .application file handler. 
Essentially, it means you click a .NET application file, and .NET just downloads stuff and starts running it. Well, that's really cool, because you don't need admin rights. You can do this as an un with an unsigned application, and you can execute with full trust. I know CAS isn't implemented, the code access security policy. Uh, so essentially, you can do pretty much whatever the fuck you want. Um, and that includes uh, running binaries, um, doing, well, pretty much anything. Now, users aren't warned. You get this dialog box that pops up that says, application run dash security warning. Again, no kiosks were able to detect this dialog box. So if .NET is installed, you win. Now, this is particularly um, important because many kiosks are now written in .NET which means the CLR is present and .NET 2 is installed. Uh, so this is basically one click, you got shell. This is, uh, I found this to be the most powerful, the easiest, uh, the, the fucking bomb. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> this, is, this is Uber. So I said to myself, you know, .NET is, is this powerful attack vector. What can I do with this? You know, how can I really expand uh, online application deployment to fully compromise kiosks and do it faster, do it better? So, I wrote a whole bunch of apps. First thing I wrote was I wrote the iCat embedded web browser. So the idea behind this is that you click a link and it'll spawn up a new web browser. It'll spawn a web browser that doesn't have the same paranoid security restrictions that the kiosk has. The similar trick to using Windows Media Player as a web browser. You can then use that web browser to then further compromise the kiosk. It works pretty good. Um, or you can just use it to browse to websites that may be prohibited or banned from the kiosk, or I, it, it just gives you a, basically a virgin or a fresh of IE. Then I wrote the iCat application executor. The idea behind this is the ability to spawn any executable you want. So you can say, I want to pop up CMD, I want to pop up notepad, command.com. It also supports macros. You can say, I want to spawn every useful application on this system. And it'll spawn 62 applications. Everything from the on-screen keyboard to task manager, regmon, uh, the help control panel, command.com, cmd.exe, uh, everything. It just does absolutely everything. Um, then I thought to myself, wow, geez, since I'm getting now pretty good at writing .NET, maybe I should write a token hijacker. So I wrote the iCat token pincher. Now, uh, recently, token hijacking has become a very hip subject. It's kind of like the new in cool thing to do. The idea is that uh, you can have a user on a Windows system which has what's called the SE impersonate privilege. Now, this is typically uh, network service users or uh, users that have slightly more rights than a user but not full admin rights, such as maybe a power user. Now, the SE impersonate privilege allows you to impersonate any available system tokens that may be on the system maybe on the, the kiosk or the terminal. So the ICAT access token pincher will enumerate all of the system tokens that are available and then pop you a system shell, which is pretty good if you have, um, if you have the SE impersonate privilege. Um, and it'll spawn cmd.exe into the context of the privilege token. Uh, this is loosely based on a script that came from Insomnia Security, uh, Brett Moore. Uh, he released something called Insomnia Shell, which was a uh, a .aspx token impersonation shell popper. Um, and I sort of adapted it and modified it and rewrote it a bit um, into the iCat access token pincher. So uh, props to Brett. Okay, so who here has ever crashed a web browser? Put your hand up. Yeah, I wanted that response. <laughs> web browsers are pretty crap, aren't they? So what about crashing a kiosk? I call this emo kiosking or kiosk self-mutilation. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so if we can create an unhandled exception in a kiosk browser, we win. Why do we win? Well, the kiosk browser crashes. Pops up that little dialog and says, oh, no, I've had an exception. I've crashed. Oh, no. Uh, then there's the desktop. <laughs> Woo. Uh, that's pretty easy, right? I mean, you win. This is, I think, one of the only situations where an application crash is actually a really highly critical vulnerability because it completely escapes the kiosk jail. So what I did in iCat was um, I found a whole bunch of really common exploits that affect winhttp.dll and msinet.ocx that cause crash situations. You, know, you can't get EIP, you, you can't pop a shell, but everything just crashes. Um, and I added all of them into iCat. Uh, so essentially, you can just click down a list and see if the kiosk crashes. Um, this is good if you just want to be a real asshole and crash a kiosk. 
Um, and this is, this is the fastest, easiest method for escaping a kiosk. Um, and it's fairly reliable. I found about 40% of kiosks crashed in some way or another. Um, I mean, that's not 100%, but it's something, right? It's, it's something. But then I thought, what about browser plugins? Ooh, bet I can crash those. So I thought to myself, well, what's the most bra common browser plugin in the world? Well, 720 million desktops have the Flash plugin installed. Oh, wow, well, I should focus on Flash. So I performed a file format fuzzing on the SWF file format, essentially trying to find um, an SWF file that would reliably crash a browser, any browser. And it turns out I found a few. <laughs> you, you can actually crash, you can crash a browser very, very reliably with Flash. Uh, the exploits I found are immediately unexploitable. These are not shell popping O'Day, but they crash. It crashes a browser. So I created what I call the iCant Auto Magic Flash Crasher. So if the Flash plugin is installed on the kiosk, iCant can crash it, guaranteed, because it's O'Day. Hey, it works. Uh, so. So the trick then is really, does the kiosk detect the unhandled exception and respawn, or does it just present the desktop? So some kiosks detect the unhandled exception. Uh, they hook the uh, SE unhandled exception filter, and they say, well, you know, shit, something bad happened. I better respawn the kiosk and continue. But a lot of the really cheaper products just don't, and they just crash, and you get the desktop, and you win. OK, so let's assume something worked. Out of that list, I, I can guarantee something worked. And let's say you have access to the kiosk file system. Maybe a command shell spawned. Maybe a common dialog popped up. Uh, maybe five minutes. All right, uh, I'm going to have to move. All right, so maybe a command shell popped up, common dialog, Java, etc. So what now? Now you need to download additional tools and binaries to the kiosk. So how do you download files in a toolless environment? So the kiosk isn't going to have wget installed, right? Um, file downloads are likely to be disabled. So how do you download stuff on a kiosk that won't really let you download stuff? OK, so old school, downloading files in Windows. You can download files using a common dialog. If you could pop up a file open dialog, you can type in HTTP colon forward slash forward slash website cmd.exe, and it'll download it. It'll save it to the temporary internet files folder, as you can see in the screenshot from below. Um, this downloads any file type or size. You can use Flash to download files. So most kiosks disable file downloads within the browser's security policy. So going into IE tools, internet options, custom level, file download, disable, as seen in the screenshot. Um, you can use the Flash file reference object to download files. And it bypasses the um, browser security policy. Flash doesn't actually validate the browser security policy, and it'll download files for you. This completely bypasses uh, browser security. Um, this is, again, another O-Day trick. Uh, this is unpublished um, and works very, very effectively. You can use Notepad to download files. You can go file open in Notepad and just download a text file. Um, it has to be 7 bit safe. Uh, it can't download 8 bit data, but you can download files using Notepad. Uh, you can use File Save and upload content to a remote website. So if you find an interesting log file on a kiosk, you can upload that using Notepad to a remote website. Another cool trick. OK, so the number one problem kiosk hacking um, is a toolless environment. So I thought to myself, ICAT needs to provide tools for kiosk hacking. Uh, so I have a whole bunch of tools there. Um, I'm going to try and run really fast this present now so we can actually do a demo at the end. So I'm not going to explain these tools to, uh, but as you can see on the list, I've got things to enable start bars, pop up things, run things, pretty much everything. Uh, they're available as .exe.zip and using the flash download method, so you can just bypass all the browser security policy crap. Um, and they're also available using VBScript and 7-bit safe, so you can download them using Notepad, which is pretty handy. Um, I'm just going to skip this. I really want to reach the demo. I want to show you guys some shell. Uh, OK, so using ICAT. Um, ICAT is a tool designed to aid penetration testing and kiosk hacking. You can use it to configure your own kiosk securely. It's real good. Um, one thing I say, want to say is don't be a dick and attack the server. Don't try and crash anything. Help me make this the best kiosk hacking tool in the world. Uh, submit me feedback. Um, also, ICAT is going to be open sourced real soon. Um, so I'm going to release iCAP Portable, so you can download it onto a, a USB disk, plug it into a kiosk. If you're a security consultant working on site, you don't have internet access. OK, so the demos. OK, so I know I said I can hack an internet kiosk in less than 120 seconds. So here, let's put the proof of the pudding. Um, I may not do a lot of talking. Just watch. <laughs> 
Okay, so here I have a kiosk. Let me just uh, full screen this. Can you guys hear me? All right, I'm going to that. All right, so I'm going to Google real fast for iCat. Paul Craig. Here's iCat. iCat. Whoa, here's iCat. Check out that picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so firstly, installed applications. Um, this kiosk is running Kioware kiosk, basic kiosk. Um, I can see I have all this shit installed. I have uh, .NET 1, I have .NET 2, I have Windows Media Player, things like that. Uh, so let's go down and see if I can pop up a common dialog. Okay, so can I pop up file? Open dialog. No, nothing happens. It's blocking the dialog from popping up. Oh, shit. Oh, no. Uh, but I know .NET is installed because they told me .NET is installed. So I can click on this, and I'm going to run for my iCat Click Once tools. I'm going to run the iCat application executor. So I have a help system here as well, using the HTML pop-ups that will basically tell you what all of the tools do. Launching application. And that, that, that's that's okay. Don't worry about that. Woo! Okay, now I have a bit of a rule here. Whenever I pop shell, you clap like wild walruses, okay? <laughs> all right? All right? Cmd.exe. Execute. Hey, shell. Now I'm going to run command shell detours. Command shell detours will try and invoke a shell through 17 different command invocation methods. This will bypass anyone that's trying to block cmd.exe or command.com. I use uh, win.com, lowfix.exe. I use start. I use every possible method on Windows to invoke a cmd.exe. And shell, 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 shell. <laughs> How much time do I have now? One. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to try and do one more kiosk. This is Internet Kiosk Pro. Why is it over here? What? Do you have the kiosk outside here? I, I on purposely didn't want to do that. <laughs> this works. Try it. It works. Nine seconds it took me. Nine seconds. <laughs> so again, I'm going to Google. Fucking. iCat, Paul, Craig. Hey, iCat. Woo, hey, iCat. <laughs> um, so, firstly, installed applications. What's installed? Hey, Internet Kiosk Pro. I got Windows Media Player 11. I got all that good stuff. I'm just going to go right down and check out some of these tools I have. I got these really kick ass tools. Can I download a copy of CMD.exe? Oh, your current security settings do not allow this file to be downloaded. Uh, what about. What about this? Command Shell D. Oh, damn, that doesn't work. Good. What about using Flash? Wait for it. Hey. <laughs> Wait for it. Hey. Woo. Woo. And shells for Africa. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Um, have fun owning kiosks. <laughs>